great stuff. Great. I know my kids had a fantastic time. Um, it's just wonderful to be able to have kids, to send them to that, that kind of a thing and see them connect together like that. Um, I don't know what Dawson was wearing in those things. I guess you could talk to him later about that. Anyway, great week. Lots of God-anchored relationships and bonds are established and deepened in weeks like that. Well, in case you've been hit or miss this summer, that's what happens in the summer, vacations, all that kind of stuff. We've been in a message series we're calling the Seven Deadly Sins of the Digital Age, and we've just been having some fun by taking that list of the seven deadly sins that so many of us are familiar with and assigning a social media platform to each of them just for, just for the sake of discussion and to get us into the topic each week. Um, we used Facebook to talk about pride. We used, we used uh, Instagram to talk about gluttony. Last week, we used LinkedIn to talk about greed. And coming fresh on the heels of our high schoolers' experience last week, what better time to talk about probably the biggest social platform of choice for the teen generation, and that is Snapchat. And we're going to use Snapchat to talk about the sin of lust this morning. Now, let me just say this, okay? If you're a parent here this morning... Maybe you have kids sitting with you and feel like, I don't know if I'm ready to let my kids hear a message about this. Let me just offer a few things, all right? First of all, we're not getting graphic this morning, okay? I'm not going to be getting any more graphic or detailed than what you can find yourself by opening up the Bible and reading some stories. However, if you've read some of the Bible stories, maybe that's not much of a consolation. There's some raw human stuff in God's Word. But also, I just want to encourage healthy and God-centered family dialogue about issues like this. Families are a safe, great place for these kind of discussions. Because if, if your kid is in middle school and they haven't heard anything on this topic yet, I promise you they're hearing it from somewhere else. And they probably have been for a few years. All right? So we're going to use the social platform of Snapchat to talk about lust. Now, maybe you're thinking, what on earth is Snapchat? I've heard of Facebook and maybe some of the others. I don't know. I can't keep up with all this stuff. Well, if you've ever seen people post pictures of themselves with uh, slightly altered facial features, things like elf ears and cat whiskers and bunny noses and starry halos, I don't know, all this stuff. That's a Snapchat thing for the most part. Snapchat is a multimedia sharing site with a mix of pictures and videos and filters and text effects, all sorts of other accoutrements. You basically send a snap to a friend, and they can view it for like 10 seconds, and then it, it, it goes away after it's been opened, disappears into some nether-layered region of cyberspace. But therein lies a bit of controversy. You see, when Snapchat was first kind of hitting the scene about seven years ago or so, it was gaining traction among some teens and young adults because it was being used for person-to-person -person illicit photo sharing. All right? That the idea that since the images are only seen by 10 seconds and then they vanish from cyberspace, or so they were led to believe, that no one would see traces on the sender's phone. So it caused quite a stir, understandably so. The Snapchat of today has moved well past the early reputation and become for teens and some young adults basically what Facebook is for us old folks. But the early reputation is enough for us to be able to use it to talk about the deadly sin of lust this morning. We've been working with the definition each week. Let's use this one for lust. It, lust is an intense self-gratifying longing for an object or circumstance. Let me pause for something very much worth noting when I say that definition. And this is a common thread in what are often called the disordered desires within the seven deadly sins. Sins like lust and gluttony and greed are where we take something that, that God has provided for our use and for our enjoyment Things like money and material goods, food, sex, whatever. And we twist those things. We disorder the desire connected to those things. And we make the pursuits of them into our master, our treasure, our God. And when they're twisted away from God's way for us to enjoy them, they become tools for destruction. That's what gluttony does. That's what greed does. That's what lust does. Okay? Okay? So here's one of the patterns that we've seen develop through all of the sins we've looked at so far. It's the term self-gratifying that's in that definition, right? When we find ourselves in a pattern of running after something, anything, for the sole purpose of self-gratification, there's often a really good chance something less than healthy is going on there, okay? We don't need to look very far in the history of human experience to observe that a life lived for self is really the emptiest life of all. 
So I want to get us started with a verse in Matthew this morning. This is Jesus talking, and as always, context is important. We'll get there in a second. But here's the passage, Matthew 5, starting in verse 27. Jesus says, You've heard that it was said, Do not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Jesus spoke these words in his famous Sermon on the Mount message, and and he was addressing an audience of people that were kind of asking the question, what does it take to be right with God? What does godly righteousness look like in the various experiences of human life? What does it mean to be right sexually in this specific instance? And in the audience that day would have been plenty of the super-religious types, the teachers of the law, the Pharisees, we've talked about those before, and they were basically answering that question by saying, look at us. Righteousness looks like us. It's about following the traditions, about conforming to our rules and regulations. It's about appearances. It's about managing the surface and how we look in front of others. They had strict rules for women where they had to cover their heads and faces and wear baggy clothing and men weren't to look at them in public and all of this external stuff. But of course, Jesus knows their hearts. He knows that they're just as wretched as everyone else. So he comes along and he says, oh no, that's not righteousness at all what you're saying. Righteousness goes way deeper. It goes to the heart. It's why he says just a few verses before, verse 20, he says, for I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. Jesus is simply communicating that sin is never a surface management issue. It's never about treating symptoms and external blemishes. It goes way deeper. Making the surface look pretty doesn't really do anything. If anything, it it just deceives. And so he scrolls through different areas of life in his Sermon on the Mount. Things like anger and lust and divorce and truth-telling and justice and love for each other. And he says, you've heard that it was said this, but I come to tell you this is what God is after. And so when he comes to the issue of our sexuality, he says, you've heard it said, do not commit adultery, but I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Now here's something interesting. The word that was translated as lust in this passage is the Greek epithumio. And that word was used to communicate any kind of strong, intense desire to have something for oneself, okay? In other scriptural translations, it was most often translated as covet. Same original word, covet. And even this, for those familiar with this passage, it was actually the word Jesus used when he was talking to his disciples in Luke twenty-two fifteen, 15, when he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Jesus knew what was coming, and he intensely desired to share that time with them. If you read the the original text, it would literally translate, with lust, I have lusted to eat this Passover meal with you. It's the same word, but here's the reason I bring that up. This is a reminder, while it's of course true that the vast majority of our understanding of the term of, of the sin of lust is connected to sexuality, it is at least worth noting that the intense longing, the lust to have something or anything apart from the character of Jesus that is inconsistent with God's word is not the life God desires for us. Okay? So this can extend beyond the world of sexuality. When you separate an intense longing from God's love and from, from the person of Jesus, it's not good. It's not where God wants us. It's a form of idolatry. It's disordered desire. It is sin. So beyond sexuality, it's just important for us to remember that. But that being said, the ancient Christian thinkers that came up with the seven deadly sins, they would have understood lust the same way that we do, okay? Connected to human sexuality. And so Jesus drops that line that we read in verse 28 during his Sermon on the Mount. Anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. And everybody who would have heard that gasped. You see, here's why. The Pharisees divided the world basically into two categories. There were the adulterers, those who had observable problems sexually, and then there were the non-adulterers, like them, or so they claimed, who didn't have such sexual problems. Two categories, that was it. 
And Jesus comes along and he says, if you think you're right before God sexually simply because you've technically never had an affair, you're wrong. The truth is we all have problems controlling our urges and our desires, our lusts. Now, don't get this wrong. Jesus is not communicating that committing adultery in our hearts is exactly the same as having an affair. Obviously, there are very different consequences. He's not saying if you thought it, you might as well do it. No, the act of committing adultery, obviously, it includes everything going on in the heart, plus layers of intent and follow-through, deceit, betrayal, the breaking of a promise, the damage to a family, the deep hurt to a spouse. So claiming the two are one and the same is never what Jesus was trying trying to communicate in any sort of legalistic way. His point is this. If we think we are sexually righteous simply because we've avoided some lawful definition of adultery, we're wrong. Even to have one lustful thought, one sexual fantasy, one brush with pornography violates God's standard, which puts us all in the same boat. That's the point. We're all fallen. Jesus wanted to put an end to all of this self righteous judgmentalism. He makes it clear we're all fallen. No more righteous versus unrighteous pharisaical garbage. He levels the playing field. We're all sinners. Let's start there. That's what Jesus is doing here, okay? And that's where all of us need to start in dealing with the sin of lust. This morning we're all fallen, okay? Whatever your lustful pleasure is seeking, whatever self-gratification you find yourself tempted to flirt with, we all have a decision to make on whether we will choose to feed and cultivate our sinful tendencies or whether we will let God help us starve and battle them. Because it's not the attractiveness or the pleasure of the thing that's the sin, it's the feeding. It's the steps that begin to take action toward that thing. And as we all know, sexuality is a place where the sin of lust has dumped so many hearts and lives off a cliff. I mean, we've heard it a million times. It's everywhere. We can't get away from it, right? TV, music videos, movies, advertising screens, billboards. We hear it in our music. It stalks us on the internet. The images fill our mind. They occupy our thoughts. What is it about sexuality that can dominate us like that? (coughs) Well, to help us deal, to help us recognize and deal with that tendency in ourselves, we're going to use a pivotal story in the life of King David to talk through kind of the warning signs, the temptations, and ultimately how to be able to look for truth and healing. Our story is found in 2 Samuel chapter 11, if you want to open your Bibles or the Bible apps on your phones and follow along this morning. (laughs) Now this story, it reads kind of like a tabloid scandal from out of the British royal household, but in this story... King David is the one with the self-gratifying wandering eyes, the the wandering hands and heart. And the results are explosive. But I want to use this story to kind of caution us to the steps that feed the destructive tendencies along the way. Because that's what we too often miss. We don't recognize it until it feels too late. And ultimately we can look to this story to see what needs to happen in order for healing and restoration to begin to take place. I think we can all find a lot of wisdom and application for our own lives as we watch this story unfold. Look at how the chapter starts. 2 Samuel 11, first verse. In the spring, at the time when kings go off to war, David sent Joab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. They destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah, but David remained in Jerusalem. Up to now, David's rise from from shepherd boy to being crowned king of Israel has been meteoric. He captures this tiny hilltop citadel from some Jebusites, turns it into his capital city, Jerusalem. The surrounding nations, they're falling like dominoes before him, and maybe that rush of power goes to his ego. Maybe he's thinking, nothing is beyond my reach. The king is so confident of his power and his position that when spring comes, Traditionally, the time when all kings go off to war with their men, David stays behind, alone, in Jerusalem. <clears throat> he lets his generals <clears throat> excuse me, and all his military men do everything and go out and fight the battle. 
He sits back and says to himself, it sure is good to be king. But that's his first mistake (coughs) that we can all learn from in falling into the trap of lust. Opportunity. David is alone. He is isolated. This opens wide the door of opportunity. There's nobody to say no. No one there to hold him accountable. Nobody to suggest a different path. He thinks no one is watching him. And so isolation provides the opportunity for temptation. There's a lot of programs for alcoholics that warn one another with this common acronym, HALT, H-A-L-T. They say, watch out for trip-ups if you are hungry, angry, lonely, or tired. It's because these conditions are the fertile soil for opportunity, for temptation. And David's isolation is the perfect setup for what happens next. It's the evening. The palace is quiet. Maybe David's restless. He rises from his bed and he walks out on the flat roof of the palace. Now there's archaeologists that have looked into the layout of Jerusalem. And there's kind of a a royal house that sits up high on the hillside at the highest ground. And the homes are all built into the slope going down. The royal house would have had a clear view over all of the town, all of the city. So it would have been a pretty common design back in that day. It says, starting in verse 2, One evening David got up from his bed and walked around on the roof of the palace. From the roof he saw a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful. And David sent someone to find out about her. The man said, She is Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam and the wife of Uriah the Hittite. So from his perch, the king notices a woman taking her evening bath below. She's unaware of the eyes that follow her every move from up on high, taking in all that they can drink in. A hunger starts to burn in the king. He should go back to bed, but he lingers a little longer. He lets the urge grow. He chooses to let it be fed. The flames of passion quickly engulf him. Engulf him. His head and heart tell him to turn away, but he refuses to hear their cry. He's king. Nothing else is denied from him. Why this? So mighty King David of Israel resolves to make another conquest. He doesn't even know her name. He wakes up a servant to find out about the woman who lives in that house below. And there's the second mistake. Observation. Temptation often enters through the eyes, although it obviously can connect through any of our senses. It's the idea of temptation on the outside connecting with hunger on the inside. There's a man who tells a story of a, of a fishing guide giving him some instruction. And the man is told if, if, uh, to catch a fish, you have to think like a fish. The goal of a fish is, is maximum gratification of appetite with minimum expenditure of energy. Guide says that fish are just a stomach, a mouth, a pair of eyes, and a bundle of appetites. And so this man is struck at how dumb the fish are. He's thinking, hey, swallow this. It's not the real thing. It's just a lure. You think it's going to feed you, but it won't. It'll trap you. If you were to look closely, fish, you would see the hook. And you'd know once you were hooked that it's just a matter of time before the enemy reels you in. The man thinks, you would think fish would wise up and notice the hook. Notice the line. Notice that every time one of those hooks gets bitten, their friend disappears out of the water never to return again. But they don't. They never learn. Aren't you so glad that we're so much smarter than fish? (laughs) That we fall for the same shiny lures, the same costume jewelry every time, don't we? Temptation deceives us into thinking the lure will satisfy our hunger, and then it sets the hook. That knocks us on the door of the third mistake we can learn from this morning with David's story. Obsession. The word is obsession. David's increasingly burning pursuit of Bathsheba is rapidly played out in this single verse. Then David sent messengers to get her. She came to him and he slept with her. Then she went back home. You can almost feel the racing pulse of the king when you read this. He sends for her, he takes her, he sleeps with her, she goes home. He pursues his obsession. He exploits her for his own gratification. She's not a person. She's an object of lust. 
This is nothing more than an act of sheer personal pleasure, self-gratification, power, conquest, determination, domination, and control. And the whole crime of passion races towards this tragic conclusion. We read just a bit later, she conceives and says, word to the king, I am pregnant. The obsession had become a locomotive, churning out of control. The effort required to stop it at this point is exponentially more than the simple act that could have stopped it early on, right? Just a a huge, huge note to take here about the trap of lust. Seek to make your resolution, your decision when you are clear-minded. Don't try to say no to the donuts when you're already in line waiting to pay for the donuts. The time to say no to the donuts is before you even got in your car, okay? So what are our obsessions? USA Today printed a survey (coughs) of about 3,000 adults in America on the subject of temptations. It listed a whole bunch of possible lures. There's like 15 of them. Possible temptations that can take control of us. They had the big ones, things like power, money, alcohol, a whole, whole mess of stuff. But in this, in this survey, there were two things that had statistical percentages through the roof when the survey came back. For both men and women, through the roof. Food and sex. Gee, any wonder the ancient thinkers distilled the seven deadly sins the way they did, right? Right? Obsessions are when something begins to get such control over us that it warps our perception of reality. And that has begun to happen with David. When I was a little kid growing up in the late 70s, I had an obsession with a specific primetime TV show. Now, I'm going to date myself. I'm going to isolate myself from my audience. All of those awful things you're not supposed to do when you're speaking publicly, but... Does anyone remember the very, very dated TV show, The Six Million Dollar Man, Bionic Man? Anyone? There's a few faithful hands. Okay, thank you. I'm proud of you. Well, this is Steve Austin, the astronaut who was rebuilt with bionics, late 70s. Oh, my word. I was so obsessed. I was like five. I would run around the house in slow motion trying to make those weird metallic running noises with my mouth. Somebody made them. There's another weird amen. All right. (laughs) Lee Majors, the actor who played Steve Austin, he always had this look. His one eyebrow was up like this. Like he was always scanning the horizon for trouble or perpetually cynical. Well, at five years old, I couldn't do that. So I would do this. (laughs) So I'm running around the house in slow motion holding my... (laughs) Just about every family picture taken during that time in my life, I'm doing this. And it's preposterous to try to explain that to anyone looking at folks. Ethan, what do you do? Never mind. I was weird. But I was obsessed. Now, we've already talked about the obsession with food and everything connected to that in our gluttony message. But lust is the raging forest fire obsession that we shy away from talking about because it makes us uncomfortable. But we said it's everywhere. Sex stuff is everywhere. Huffington Post suggests that more than 30% of all data transferred across the internet is porn-related. That porn sites receive more regular traffic than Netflix, Amazon, and Twitter combined. Just wrap your head around that for a second. It is destroying relationships and marriages. And we have no idea the impact it's having on generations of children and teens and their worlds moving forward. This lust obsession for men, of course, is usually visual. For women, it tends to be more relational. There's a female Christian author that wrote the following. I have a dear friend who is in a marriage that is hard, just plain old hard. And rather than face the pain of the hard, (laughs) she escapes for hours in the day. into an imaginary fantasy movie that stars another man in her church. A man who doesn't know how she feels about him, so she thinks it's safe. But she spends an amazing amount of time daydreaming about this person. It has such a grip on her, and she knows full well it is an idol for her, but she doesn't know how to get it out of her life, and it competes for and obscures who God is. That's what lust does. 
it obscures an accurate picture. And that word actually brings us to David's fourth mistake, to obscure or cover up the evidence in this case. David's trying to work to clean his tracks. That's the stage that we can also learn from in the sin of lust. David, the man of action, immediately devises a cover-up. The king immediately calls her husband, Uriah, back to Jerusalem. You'd think that's the last guy he'd want to be talking to, but he calls him back. He's king after all, right? He can do what he wants. He calls the shots. David reasons that Uriah, like all soldiers on furlough when they're given a break, will want to sleep with his wife. So Bathsheba's pregnancy will be attributed to him. Right. So David tells him, Go down to your house, Uriah, wash your feet, have a good evening, you've earned it. Gives him a wink and a slap on the back and sends him down. Except, Uriah doesn't go home. It says in verse 9, But Uriah slept at the entrance to the palace with all his master's servants and did not go down to his house. He sleeps at the entrance to the palace with the servants. David's like, dude, why didn't you go home? You just came back from an extended time of grueling battle. And here's what Uriah says, verse 11. Uriah said to David, The ark and Israel and Judah are staying in tents, and my commander Joab and my Lord's men are camped in the open country. How could I go to my house to eat and drink and make love to my wife? As surely as you live, I will not do such a thing. Okay, listen, by this point, shouldn't this be enough to set off every last remaining godly alarm in David's conscience? The answer of this foreigner rains shame down on the mighty king of Israel. He's unwilling to indulge himself while his fellow men suffer. But David, while soldiers fight and die for him, he lies in the lap of luxury and takes this man's wife. He doesn't listen to the alarms. He's unfazed. Do you see the warping that has taken place by this point? He's blind to perspective on reality and what he needs to address. He gets Uriah drunk the next night to dull his conscience, but still the soldier sleeps it off in the entrance to the palace instead of going home. So finally, David, not knowing what else to do, he sends him back to the front lines carrying a note that basically says, put him on the front lines, make sure he gets killed. So Uriah heads back to battle carrying his own death warrant. When news of his death reaches the home front, the king graciously consoles the grieving widow, and then after whatever a respectable length of time is, he marries her. It's a difficult story to read because we watch the heaviness and the darkness and the shame along the way. We feel it for David. He doesn't feel it yet. He thinks the cover-up's complete. No one suspects. No eyes have seen, except for this nagging verse that ends the chapter. And the thing David has do- had done was evil in the eyes of the Lord. <clears throat> the very next day, Nathan the prophet, David's closest advisor, shows up and tells David this strange story about, about a rich man who owns a huge number of sheep and livestock, cattle, and then a poor man who has just a little lamb as a family pet that sleeps with his family at night. When a friend from out of town visits... The rich man doesn't take one of his numerous sheep or calf or anything, but instead takes a little lamb from the poor man and sacrifices it, has it slaughtered. David, as a former shepherd, is absolutely outraged. The man who did this deserves death. He must pay for the lamb four times over for his heartless crime. Who is this evil man? And Nathan looks David squarely in the eye and says, You are that man. Of course, David knows he's caught. I have sinned against the Lord, he confesses. It's the first thing David has done right so far. Not that he has much choice. He confesses. Do not miss the importance, the staggering importance of letting your lips proclaim your wrongdoing. Do not miss confession. Confess to God. Confess to someone you trust. Say that you have sinned. The final outcome of all this is obliteration. Lust leaves David to break God's law against coveting, adultery, and murder. And the consequences, the cost of his passion, are beyond calculation. Nathan goes on to prophetically outline, in fact, all of the awful sin and the dysfunction that will now take place within David's family. 
in generations to come that will bring far, far more public shame, pain, and grief on David than his one act alone ever could have. What starts off as a hunt for pleasure unleashes a chain reaction that leads to family dysfunction, pain, and death. Because that's what sin does. Too often we see sin and its consequences and we think it's God punishing us. It's just what sin does. And God knows the pain that it causes and He longs for us to choose otherwise. It's why God longs for us to be willing to grab hold of His far better way through the abiding presence of His Holy Spirit to guide our steps. Sexuality, like all of God's gifts, is designed for use within God's storyline, not the storyline we choose for ourselves based on our desires. Misuse leads to wounding, to danger, to complexities and difficulties that can last generations. And that's not supposed to sound like a threat. It's just what sin does. The church hasn't always done a good job of clarifying that it's not a threat. You see, sex was never a bad word. Sexual sin is no more or less a sin than any other. It just happens to be one that is inextricably tied to layers of physiological and emotional realities of who we are as human beings and how we're wired. And so therefore, it can have profound effects beyond just the scope of ourselves. It's what happened in David's story. It is so destructive when we turn it into something we long for to please ourselves. Because at that point, If you distill down all of the liberal arguments and the freedom fighter movements that try to make a case for why some people believe that God's blueprint for sexuality is is old-fashioned or is irrelevant or is perhaps misunderstood or maybe it was written down wrong or something of the sort, when you boil away all the rhetoric, it comes down to the same argument of so many other sins. It sounds something like this. God loves us. He wants our best. He doesn't want us in pain and woundedness. And so here's what he says. But I don't want to do that. (laughs) That's what's there when we boil it all away. I want to do it my way. And I wonder if that's, if it's like God rolling his eyes, much the same way as when a loving parent gets in an argument with a two-year-old. No, I don't want to. Oh, dear child. I had a lot of those when my kids were toddlers. When we insist on seeking life on our own terms, varying degrees of unidealness happen. This is probably an overused illustration, but it's been said that sex is like fire. Within the confines of a safety of a fireplace, it can be a wonderful thing, bringing light and warmth into a home. But outside of the boundaries of the fireplace, it can reduce that same home to a pile of ashes in a matter of minutes. It makes all the difference where the fire is allowed to burn. Everyone here, if you're involved in pornography, in premarital sexual activity, in an extramarital affair, in emotional fantasies, the Lord is pleading with you, please, child, don't play with fire. He's not there with some sort of cat of nine tails waiting to whip you He is pleading with you like a loving parent who doesn't want to see you go through the layers of pain that can take place because that's what sin does. 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 3 to 8. Let's close with this passage. It is God's will that you should be sanctified, that you should avoid sexual immorality, that each of you should learn to control your own body. Self-control again. More patterns we see in this. Control your own body in a way that is holy and honorable, not in passionate lust like the pagans who do not know God. And that in this matter, no one should wrong or take advantage of a brother or sister. Another pattern, affecting someone else other than yourself. The Lord will punish all those who commit such sins as we are told, as we told you and warned you before. For God did not call us to be impure, but to live a holy life. Therefore, anyone who rejects this instruction does not reject a human being but God, the very God who gives you His Holy Spirit. If you're here this morning and you're trapped in this kind of sin, do not. I repeat, do not. Just try and buck up and handle it yourself. It didn't work for David, and it won't work for you. 
Talk to a godly friend you trust. Confess your sin to God. Knowing that that His Holy Spirit has the power to guide and to order your steps as you submit to Him. As you learn His grace-filled rhythms of self-control. And you walk out of the world of shame and into God's wonderful light. We're going to close by taking communion together, as we do many weeks. We take communion every week. It's something that the New Testament church did. It was what Jesus himself, he said, when you gather together, do this to remember me. And communion is simply a time where we take bread and juice, symbols of Jesus' body and blood that were given up for us on a cross. And we look to that as our purchase price, as our value, as our promise and our hope. It's the weekly reminder that centers and anchors us. This is how I am defined, not by all my own mess. So as we spend time in communion, as you spend time in reflection and the band plays lightly, I'd encourage you to spend some dedicated time communicating with God. Maybe there's some things you you and God need to talk about that you need to deal with. Maybe you don't even know what words to say. That's okay. Do your best. He knows your heart already. And he loves you. Trays are passed with the bread and the juice. Take the bread and eat it. Take the juice and drink it. The body, the blood of Jesus. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's pray together.